uh, I believe what Dennis is going to be going through is he's got his internet service providers modem router combo. You guys know those, right? Uh, and uh, what he did is he hooked it up for fun because obviously he doesn't use it out of the box, right? But he hooked it back up for fun, and we're going to start breaking into it and seeing what types of kind of goodies we get, right? So this is going to be a live exercise uh, and us trying to do a little bit of reverse engineering and poking and prodding, right? At this ISP modem router WAP combo device, right? Seeing if we can break into it, see how far we can get, have a little, have a little bit of fun in the process. I believe Dennis, you created a little bit of a guide, right, in the mindset of a malicious actor, right, that you'll go through probably first, right, uh, and then obviously open up the Q and A at the end. So, Dennis, sure. you want to take it away, my man? Sure. Yeah, I can take it away. Let me get, uh, let me copy this link for the Notion page here. Uh, let me grab this, and I'm going to throw this into chat. Let's see. Make sure that's right. Okay. Five through three. Let's make sure this looks good. Okay, cool. So uh, I'm also doing this as a guest account, um, mostly because uh, rather than do it on a work laptop that has security restrictions, um, I'm running this on a, a completely virtual machine on a different system. Um, that way it's all nice and clean. What I prefer to do normally, um, because I do sometimes uh, take a look at malware samples, things like that, um, I'll throw up a VM, Hyper-V. Uh, it's got all my tools, everything installed. Uh, something goes wrong, can just checkpoint it back to the last, uh, last working state, so that should be fine. Um, so... First, let me go over. Let me go over the mindset. Uh, so, red team mindset. So, let me share on my screen. Here. Let's see. Oh, probably because my proxy's down the line. Okay. Cool. All right. Can everybody see this? Yep, looks good. Got it. Fantastic. Awesome. So um, normally what I like to do um, is I like to go through and just, you know, break the application, right? But uh, when Christian and I talked about it, uh, we talked about walking through an actual, you know, basically a pen test. Um, you know, I had to sit down and I had to think about it. I thought, you know, how, what am I actually doing, right? I had to put that in the words. Um, and I came up with four points. Um, so um, these are typically the, uh, this is the thought process that I use um, when I go into uh, any sort of engagement. Um, so the first thing that I like to do, um, I like to know my adversary. Um, so where do they feel safest? Normally, under normal circumstances, if you're a blue team person, um, I come from blue team background, um, whenever you feel a component safe, there's just a, there's a little bit of a bias to exclude it from being as thorough on security testing, right? And this is common across the board, not just, not just myself, it's across everything. If people feel that they're safe, that's when they're the most insecure. Um, because what'll happen is if they know, oh, this is a risky component that we need to be careful with, they'll put a bunch of security controls on it, they'll put a bunch of review on it, make sure that it's good. But, you know, if you have a, for instance, if you have a, an application that shares files, they may thoroughly test the file share application component, but they may not check the avatar upload. You may be able to upload malicious files that way. Um, so wherever they feel safest, that's probably the weakest point that you can attack. Um, what's the purpose of the application? Again, look for what they don't expect. If the purpose is to upload files, that's probably thoroughly tested. Um, I would take a look at it, obviously. You wanna check and make sure that there's nothing that they missed that was obvious. Um, but relative to the rest of the application, the primary function is normally going to be most protected just because it's the forefront of their thought process. Um, and the third big point, what threat models are focused, right? And so if you have a web application that has unauthenticated users or low authenticated users, uh, you know, that's probably going to be their focus. Um, in really good security models, they're going to anticipate admin users being malicious, um, but that's not always the case. A lot of times what they'll assume is they'll say, yeah, Admin, eh, they'd never do anything wrong. It's like WordPress, right? They'd never upload a malicious uh, WordPress plugin. That would never happen. Um, so there's just, there's really lax, uh, lax security controls. Uh, and, and, and it goes back to assuming it's safe, right? If they assume the admin account's always gonna be safe, you're not gonna get anywhere. Um, so 
what threat model um, for web applications, normally low unauthenticated users, um, for things like routers, which is what we're attacking tonight, um, they're going to be looking at external threats, right? If you're a router manufacturer, what's your threat model? It's going to be external sources. It's going to be anything coming from the WAN. It's going to be the services that you expose to the WAN. Normally, you're not going to care as much, or you may throw a little bit of a blind eye towards the internal security. So that is the admin login, um, the local web interface for administration, things like that. You may not consider that a security, you know, security threat, but if they can get that far, if they can get access to something like that, they can just blow it wide open. Um, so that's first, know your adversary, right? Know what their mindset is, know what they think should be secure, and then you attack at the weakest chain. Um, second, know their stack. Um, what kind of protections are in place? So in web applications, you're going to run into WAFs, right? Um, most of the time, they're going to have different filtering on it. Um, you know, sometimes they'll filter different keywords at the WAF level. You can sometimes bypass that. Um, really good method if you have JSON. Uh, you know, do Unicode uh, encoding for the strings. You'll bypass a basic string filter um, and you'll still get your content interpreted on the back end when it goes to, you know, um, dump the JSON string. Um, so knowing the protections in place, you got to know them to get around them. Uh, second thing, like I said, what frameworks are utilized in the application? If you know what frameworks are used in the application, you can know what's homebrew, you can know what's provided by the library, um, and you can understand expected responses. Um, knowing how the framework works gives you a better level of insight to be able to determine when something's potentially breakable um, versus when it's not. Um, it keeps you from going down you know, dead end paths. Um, just good knowledge to have in general. Uh, and third, how do parts fit together? So secure components, they can be fine on their own, but if you start stringing them together, there's some misconfiguration that can happen. For instance, OAuth, right? A lot of times, what I'll see, um, we've run into this several times, is that uh, customers will take OAuth and they'll look at the client secret and they will assume that because it's called client secret, it's perfectly fine to expose to JavaScript um, and load it, in a, it load it in the actual browser side. Um, not the case at all. Um, you want to be absolutely absolutely sure um, that that value is not distributed because then you can just start issuing you know tokens terrible 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 thing when that happens but it happens often so all of that to say things can be fine on their own but if they start to get misconfigured when they're joined together that could be a security uh, that's a, that could be an attack vector um, three know your tools um, so how do you get better with X? My recommendation, CTF challenges. That's where I come from. I did CTFs for a while. Um, I think it gives you some good insight because you don't know what you don't know. You'll run into things that you've never run into before. You'll run into applications and frameworks that you've never tested before. Um, and it's always good to keep yourself up to date on that kind of thing. That way, you, anything that they throw at you, you can handle with, you know, at least some, some low to moderate proficiency. Um, Another thing I'd like to say, automated tools. So a lot of people and a lot of security companies, um, my uh, previous employer ran into this. Um, they, a lot of these smaller security companies or firms will try to use automated tools as a stopgap for having um, knowledgeable personnel that are able to manually tamper. Um, automated tools have their place. Um, and it's my opinion that they have their place as, um, uh, kind of a uh, precision target, right? So if you have a SQL injection you can't have work uh, or you can't get to work the way you want, maybe throw SQL map at it, see if you can hit that one endpoint, right? You can do a Hail Mary, you can have it scan the whole application, but you may not get very far with it. Automated tools are typically best used, I think, um, when you have a component that you know is vulnerable and you can hit it with it and it just saves time. Um, or in another case, um, you know, if it's tedious to test all the endpoints and you know all of them do SQL queries, it might be best to throw it at it. Um, otherwise, it just generates a lot of noise. It's a lot of stuff when you could be doing precise testing and tampering. Um, what about X or what about tool Y? Why don't you know? Why don't we use X? Um, my advice, as far as tools go, um, if you see industry standards, you know, use this tool. Um, use whatever you're comfortable with. Sometimes you'll have restrictions, right? If your employer or a customer has restrictions on what tools you can use, you know, you're limited in that case. But generally speaking, use what you're comfortable with. You'll get further that way. You'll be more efficient. But at the same time, be open to change, right? Sometimes the things that you do may not be the most efficient in the world. Be open to potential change but also you got to maintain some level of, you know, work with what you're comfortable with. Um, for personal testing, that's what I do. I work with what I'm comfortable with. Um, and four, know your limits. So, you know, it's okay to ask for help. Um, normally the people that you work with want you to succeed. Your business, you know, wants you to succeed. The better you do, the better they do, the better everybody does. Um, at the same time, while you should be open to ask for help, don't resign yourself to, you know, 
stop challenging yourself. It's very easy when you have someone who's proficient in some subject matter to throw everything at them. Um, it's, you know, it's human nature to want to walk away from challenge, right? Um, the trick is you have to be willing to challenge yourself in some cases. Um, and at the same time, you know, no one to throw in the towel. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> know your limits, man. Know your limits. Know my limits. I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. Um, you know, uh, so I before you you jump in, I have a quick note. So you were talking about CTFs. I really liked, and then you also brought off the example to point number two uh, with WAFs, right? And doing WAF bypass, right? With understanding the technology stack in place. So I'm just going to take like 60 seconds as the dogs calm down, right? To yep. provide a little bit of a tidbit in the story. So my first experience of, of doing uh, any type of red teaming or pen testing actually was when I was previously on a blue team, I worked for a large multi-specialty medical uh, healthcare provider. And um, it was us network folks. We were born and bred network folks, mostly Cisco, VMware, uh, EMC storage type of folks, right? And so uh, we had never developed any real pen testing experience or anything like that. We just, at the time it was Black Backtrack Linux. We downloaded it, we were playing with it, we were trying different things. And our chief technology officer, uh, he basically challenged us uh, to uh, the two network admins at our organization, pitted us against one another and said, hey, listen, I want you guys to do a scenario and exercise where, you know, we try to hack into our own systems, right? And this red team, blue team thing, right? And this was before I even understood what the fuck red team and blue team meant. But one of the things I did understand really well at that time was because I was a Cisco CCMP uh, and routing and uh, switching, uh, was that the new nice Cisco ASAs that we had deployed, they had the nice new intrusion prevention modules on them with the snort firewall rules, right? And so when we were doing this exercise, which now I realize is like a again, like a red team, blue team exercise, or maybe kind of our own mini CTF, right, that we were doing at the time, but um, we could pretty much have anything goes because we had scheduled network maintenance and downtime. We did this over the weekends. And so one of the things that I had thought about doing was as a distraction mechanism against the other network admin, because I was playing the adversary, he was playing the defender, was that I would purpose, or what I purposely did was I created a bunch of exploits and attacks and I hit the IPS purposely, right? Where it was really, really obvious and it was gonna block me, but I spoofed all the IP addresses and I spoofed all the IP addresses of legitimate systems on the network. So I took down the rest of the network because the IPS blocked everything else, but not me, right? And then after that, because everything was in disarray, that allowed me to kind of continue a little bit forward. So that's just a little bit of an example of knowing the technology stack that you're working with, right? And knowing the parameters and con confines of it and perhaps leveraging it and using it against itself, right? And obviously that mix mixes well with, you know, doing CTF exercises, which I think allows people to think more outside the box. So Dennis, back to you. Absolutely. So, let me grab this real quick here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab. Cool. So um, one of the things I talked about, um, point number, let's see, point number one, what threat model is the focus, right? Threat model for this router is external. We're going to try and be internal um, in this case, but um, we'll start off with some basics. We'll kind of review just to walk you down memory lane for this. Um, I won't lie to everyone here. I have done testing on this. This is not my first time. I've got fairly far, but we'll walk you all the way through it. So. Real quick. Whoops. Uh, yes. What's the internet service provider and make a model of the router? Just out of curiosity. Absolutely. Uh, so the internet service provider is uh, Shawnee Link. Also, by the way, uh, please don't DOS me. This is my IP address. You guys are cool. I trust you. Just please don't DOS me. Um, it is a it is a Shawnee Link uh, uh, ISP, uh, and the router is a Calix Gigaspire uh, U4. Um, so it is it is a um, it's a standard model. They use this on all of the Shawnee Link connections. So what's really interesting is, uh, and, and this opens up if you were a malicious actor, this opens up a really interesting point. Um, so given that this is the standard model that's deployed with Shawnee Link, Shawnee Link has a dedicated IP range. If you were to potentially find a external level vulnerability, you have a list of IPs 
because you know the IP range. You have the model that's standard deployed. If you could find a vulnerability on it, you could just scan through the IP range and take over every single router in the range. Um, so fun little trick um, and another thought um, as far as that goes. But we're not doing any external exploits. We're not gonna we're not gonna destroy Shawnee Link today. Um, so uh, normally, um, we'll see how the authentication method works. Um, so this this is funny. This says after ten failures, page will be protected. Uh, so let's open. Uh, let's get our proxy settings going. So you know, I've got a proxy shortcut here. Set it to loop back, uh, and we'll bring open Burp Suite community. Good old Burp Suite. Um, oh, come on. I know there's a new addition. I don't want to upgrade to it right now. So bring this on a little bit. Okay, so go to scope. Cool. Uh, so load up the page. So first things to notice, this is an HTTP connection. Um, router does not redirect you to HTTPS. Um, it does actually support HTTPS, but it does not redirect you on port 80 to HTTPS. So that's interesting. Um, we do have some things that are coming up here. What we'll do, we'll scope our uh, we'll scope our target here. Uh, we'll throw it in here, and we will filter to show only in-scope items. All right, cool. We've got our main page. So let's submit some test data. Let's do test, test. You'll notice that it says you have failed two times, and you'll be blocked after a certain amount of failed attempts. And this seems to carry over, uh, depending on user account. See, that's the interesting part. If you know the user account name, it doesn't actually give you that warning that you are going to get locked out. So we already know that admin. Different error messages. I love we that. already we already know that admin versus test. We already know admin's a valid account, right? Even so there's a incorrect incorrect username or password, as if it was actually done correctly in the first place. Exactly. So that's so that's funny. Uh, if we look at the request here, we see it's got some kind of funky. Uh, authentication method that's going on. Um, what this actually is, I'll cheat a little bit and tell you, if you were to dig into the JavaScript code, which I think I can force refresh and load. Um, this is the other thing, by the way, when you're looking at an application like this, um, it's a really good idea to look at application code, as in JavaScript code, because uh, there's a lot of things they leave in there they don't expect you to look at. For instance, if I look at .cgi, I believe, oh no, we do have one. Okay, so this one's basic. So we can see what's going on here. We have a little bit of what's going on. We have a uh, encode auth, which apparently is the username, plus a single quote, plus a nonce, which is generated somewhere, I'm sure, plus a uh, per, uh, semicolon, semicolon, I'm losing my mind. Plus a colon, plus a colon. I don't know why I had a stroke there. Uh, plus a colon, plus password. Password is just the password, username is username. So we have MD5 hash of our username, nonce, and password. And that is actually the auth component that's being encoded. So we have an idea of how it's being generated. So MD5, not great start, um, not very secure. Technically could be brute forced. Um, but here's the thing. We are not actually going to try and brute force it. Remember, we are the internal threat actor. So we can get a little further than that because I know the admin console, right? The admin console comes default with the router. We can log into that. There's other user accounts, I will say. We don't have access to them yet. So uh, we already know what the password is and all that. So let's just cheat. Let's grab the username and password. So I know it's admin and I know the password and we will log in. So here we have our main interface. So uh just looking at it at a glance um we do have some commands that are getting hit we have some uh you know not necessarily exposing information we have a little bit of information but nothing outside the normal that an admin would expect to see um we have some things here we also have this authorization token now that we've logged in so my first inclination what's the authorization token look like it's obviously some base 64 encoded value but it's not a jwt because you'll notice there's no dots in here so let's send it to decoder take a look at what's going on with it also by the way another great tool if you're familiar with burp suite decoder great tool is cyberchef cyberchef is one of the best applications uh or I was about well, to say, why don't you pull that out my man 
Yeah, let me pull up CyberChef. CyberChef can be run completely offline. It is a self-contained uh, HTML page, and it has encryption, different encodings. You can chain together everything. We actually, we've used this before um, for customers. We've actually uh, done testing with this tool. Very nice tool. Uh, so for instance, we'll throw in this uh, Base64 value. We'll search Base64, we'll say from Base64, boom, we've got this. Uh, so we can see it's got admin, it's got this, it's got this. So what is this? Well, if we backtrack a little bit, I think we can actually figure out what some of this is. Um, let's see, is that the correct login? Yes, it is. So we have EC and 87. No, okay, I'm wrong actually, okay. Either way, um, so they don't seem to correlate with the nonce or the authorization at all. Seems to be independent values. Um, we do know it's probably some MD5 hash based on the way that the front end works, or we can at least guess that. Um, so we'll say that this is maybe MD5. We'll look into it a little further later. Um, so off the top, like I said, we've got nothing really going on here. We've got this neat application JS file. Let's take a look. We know the endpoints are .cgi. So let's see. So we've got some CGI parameters here. So we so now we know here's some endpoints we can try and test. We've got some different uh, different endpoints to test. But what's more interesting? Let's just try and search. Uh, let's try and search admin. Well, we've got some admin pages here. Okay, we've got some stuff going on. Big file, there's a lot to go through. If you wanted to, you could parse it out and you could try to understand every single thing that it works. Um, but that is a lot to go through. So in an effort to save time, let's ignore that for now. Let's move on and see what else we got. We got a vendor script. So this is just looks like jQuery and Bootstrap. Probably nothing interesting. I mean, you can look through it if you want, but considering it's vendor, it's probably third-party code that's relatively secure. Um, we look at uh, CGI post parameter. Now this is interesting because we have current username and hidden page support start, which we can see is a, um, that's an HTML comment right there. It's a little odd, a little odd. Um, so what is hidden support stat, right? What does that do? Well, curiosity, let's try this. Let's set up intercept server responses. We'll set it to where we intercept the server URL refresh the page here and i believe um, oh i don't have intercept on whoops turn intercept on now we refresh the page okay we get the get request we forward we get the response we get the this is the request for the info for hidden page looks like okay here's our response so it's out of curiosity let's see what happens if i make this let's try this null let's set it to null why not it's json object null should work right we got another instance where that's like that let's let's do that let's see what happens so we set it to null, we forward it. I'm going to drop intercept because we don't need to. And suddenly, if you'll notice, let's load the normal page. We suddenly have access to two menus that we're not supposed to normally have access to. Um, so in removing the HTML comment, we have introduced some new endpoints. So next feature, you know, can we access them? Looks like we can access them pretty, pretty accurately. So uh, I would assume, based on this information, that this is probably uh, based on the name. Let's see, where's the name for this? Oh, come on, HTTP history. Hidden page support. I'm going to guess this is the support for the ISP. That's my guess. That's what I'm throwing out there. I'm going to guess this, 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 this is uh, support settings that's normally not accessible to us. So let's look around. Well, we've got TR69. Got some interesting thing here. This works. I don't know. This actually reveals a password. We'll leave that for now. Um, let's see, we've got some WAN settings. We can check out the WAN settings. We've got some different things going on here. We can check the status. We can see our uplinks. We can see our D, uh, DNS servers. By the way, interesting note, um, the normal user can configure the DNS servers and it shows them that they've configured the DNS servers, but internally it does not listen to those rules at all and it uses the built-in DNS servers. Doesn't care what you think. Oh man, um, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> I love it when ISPs do shit like that. They're like, fuck you. So that, yeah, that's a great thing. Um, so, okay, well, let's take a look. We've got DNS server mapping. We've got some interesting points here, right? We've got IGMP, stuff like that, smart activate, remote admin. This also has some, you know, credentials here. Uh, we've got some shaping, you know, different things, ACLs. Let's see what else we got. We have device logs, detailed status and debugging log file. Well, that might be good. Let's come back to that in a minute. We've got configuration. I want to generate a golden config. Let's try to generate. Oh, well, that's nice. So we need to know a version. Okay, let's try this. 
Golden config is disallowed because WAN uplink's been allowed. Okay, so that's good in nowhere. Diagnostics. Looks like we have the ability to do a packet capture of some kind, and we have advanced expressions. And it looks like down here, this is just running TCP dump from the expression. So that'll be fun. Let's let's uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. These are all fun tools. Uh, so so basically, I want to get into a little bit here um, on a side note. Um, so there is a terminology um, when you are um, analyzing or developing malware. There's a technique they use called living off the land. Um, living off the land, LOL, um, is a neat technique. Um, other people, if you're familiar with binary analysis, they'll call it uh, gadgets, right? They'll call them gadgets. Basically, what you're doing is you're taking things that exist on a system already, and you're leveraging them for your uh, for your own purposes. Um, in our case, we're going to try and leverage the, the uh, packet capture functionality. We're going to try and leverage the uh, uh, device log saving, and we're going to try and leverage that to our advantage to see if we can get any further. So, um, you know, we've got a couple things here. Um, since we're about halfway through on time, I'll skip a little bit. Let's say we test all these. You know, we go through, we look at them, we look at the requests. Eh, you know, there's a couple things going on here that look interesting. It looks like it's issuing some capture commands. We might try and inject, right? We might try to send some invalid actions, right? See what kind of messages we get. Now eh, we get nothing. We get no response there. Well, let's go here. Let's say that we do this, right? We get a session key. Let's try uh, send an X, see what kind of error we get. Well, it gets a default value. You know, you can tamper with some of the values, see if you can get anything to hit. Um, but it doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere. You can change some of these things, you know. Yeah, we get a 200, right? So generally speaking, you tamper some values. Eh, you know, you get a 200. You don't get very far than that. You might try some, you know, some escaping. You might try to throw a single quote in there or something like that. Same result. So we test all these parameters. So now we're stuck. You know, where do we go from here? We've got access to the support console. We've got access to information that probably should be restricted to us, but uh, they do a, a nice little thing called a client side dictation of server side access controls. Um, so that's great. But um, needless to say, we do have device logs. Let's save a log. Let's look at what's in the log. Uh, now this log is going to be a little crowded because I've previously tampered with it, but we can get an idea of what's going on here. Um, so it'll take a second to generate, and we'll take a look at some of the support stuff that we get. We get a nice tar gz file. Cool. So let's throw a new folder open here. Whoops, not new shortcut. Let's throw a new folder open. We'll grab this tar gz file. We'll open it up in 7-zip. Take a look inside. And off the bat, this is a lot of information for a support technician to have. Looks like we've got some boot calyx files, some kind of master config, which looks interesting. Um, we've got TR69, got some var log. Oh, and this is really, this is a lot of information. It looks like down here even we've got an HTTP CGI log, which I would assume is the server. So let's take all this. Let's just, uh, let's dump it into a new folder. Here. So we got it in this new folder. Let's try this. Let's grab... I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna plug our GitHub repo real quick here, Christian. Uh, <laughs> I was about let to me say secret scanner. Please tell me you're gonna do secret scanner. Secret searcher, but yeah, secret secret, secret searcher. searcher. Okay. Same oh, thing. Gotta yes, we got his own version. I got I gotta plug my own. Yeah. I, plus, it's you know, secret secret scanner is a Bash script. I don't have Windows for Linux on here. We'll just throw it in Python. Oh, <laughs> you make chain jelly, man. <laughs> so we'll do secret searcher. I've got it open on my other machine here. We're gonna just uh, pull the file contents over. This is a nice little Python file I came up with. Works out really well. Um, uses uh, multi-threading to uh, scan as fast as it possibly can. So we're gonna run Python on this is secret searcher. This is the uh, little syntax for it here. So we'll do secret searcher. We're gonna search the current directory and you can specify secrets. So um, first thing I'm gonna look for is admin, right? I'm gonna do case insensitive because why not? That's a lot of information off the bat. So we're getting a lot of uh, we're getting a lot of admin uh, usernames come up here. Most of this is the result of me tampering with log files, things like that. But just a quick analysis through it here. We've got some different things. We've got some config. We've got admin states. Let's see what else we've got. Um, what file looks interesting? We got X merge. Whoops, went too far. Uh, we got some HT. Oh, here we go. HTTP. Ah. 
Check off. Well, that's interesting. Let's take a look at check off, huh? Let's take a look at check off here. Let's see, 128 HTTP CGI. Let's open it with code. And I'll throw this in, uh, we'll throw this in log format. So, uh, you know, that's interesting. That's interesting. We get uh, some admin credentials, old account info error. Got some interesting log files here. Yeah, you got some basic stuff, invalid X paths and different things here. Okay. MD5 auth check failed. So we're getting some kind of auth check failure. So let's look at these values here. We've got an F5, F7. None of these look similar. Okay, well, let's let's try this, right? Let's, um, we're getting some failures. We got to figure out where the failures are coming from. Let's try and do some token tampering and see if we can get it to reproduce a failure. Or actually, no, we've decoded this. Let's see, this is 97557. Do we have that? 97557? No, we don't have that. Okay, all right. Let's do some token tampering. Let's try X, right? Let's say, duplicate this. So now that we have access, now that we have access to these log files here, what I'm basically going to try to do, my thought process is check is failing for admin sometime and we get a log file and we get some interesting values here. So it might be interesting to try and find out what these values mean. Uh, what we may do um, is we may go back here and grab uh, this token here. And let's just try and replicate that. Let's take the token, throw it in. Let's do XX, right? Because we don't know what these values are. Let's do XX. And we will 2 base 64 that. Give this nice little short string value. Let's try this as an authentication, see what it does. And we get a we get a redirect to the login page from the looks of it. Let's do this. Let's try and see if that generated anything in our log file, right? Because we did X colon X. Maybe we got somewhere with it. Because we're looking, if it's willing to dump that there's an authorization failure there, maybe it's dumping our password somewhere else, right? Maybe it's dumping a little more information than what we expected. We can already see from the output um, that it is doing some kind of hash on it. And I don't know what this is, but that looks strange. It seems to be doing stars. It's almost like it's censoring something out there. Uh, so let's do this. Let's get rid of our folder for the time being. Action mechanism. It's what, say again? I said it's a piss poor redaction mechanism. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we'll take a look. We'll see. Let's try this. Let's. Uh, what is? I can't see my window. Oh, this is what's open. Duh. Okay. There we go. Cool. So let's make a new folder. Let's do. Uh, let's do a download again. See how far we can get. So we've just got the second targz file. Let's open this up. We'll pull out this log proxy info. Whoops. Pull out this log proxy info. Go in. Grab it. Throw it here. I have, in my haste, completely removed Secret Searcher from the system. So we're just going to copy it back here. All right, cool. And we know that that file was var log HTTP CGI. That's where we saw that. Uh, that's where we saw that bit of code before. Let's go back and look. So we've tried some tampering. Oh, well, look at that. We've got access. So this is our password here. And this is interesting. This looks like, uh, you know, XX this is the admin. This is, uh, let, me, let me highlight this again. I don't know why it's in Go. Uh, so this is our uh, this is our token that we supplied, right? X colon X. So, and it expects some value, MD5 in, MD5 out. Well, if we take a look here, if you're observant, uh, you'll notice that if we go back to our CyberChef here, um, tokens 978557, the value that we copy and pasted, 978557. So uh, the log actually spits out the expected token. So we're actually able to get the expected token from a failed login, and we can know exactly how to log in. But that doesn't help us any, right? I mean, we're the admin user already. We already know what the admin token is, and we got this far. You should know the admin token. Not good, still interesting. Also, um, by the way, this you can see our previous tampering attempts are uh, <laughs> logged in here as well. So we do have some manipulation over the log file. Huh. Very minor. So, uh, so we know that it spits out some tokens, and um, you know, there's there's probably there's probably some other interesting finds that we can do in this uh, this dump. So let's do this. Let's do um, let's do secret searcher again. Let's go back to our let's go back to our old standby. We'll do secret searcher. We'll do current directory. We'll say for secrets. We'll say uh, let's say user. Let's see what we can pull for user. Oh, we get a lot of stuff for user. Oops. 
completely destroyed my console formatting by full screening that. That was my bad. Um, here we go. We'll do Python secret searcher dot s. We'll say uh, yeah. We'll say user. Let's see what we can find with user. We get some user logs here. Get some different things like that. Let's uh, let's pause this real quick. Let's look at some of the top ones. So it looks like we've got a master config copy. This looks really interesting to me, right? Master config copy. That sounds great. Let's check that out. Let's do device manager. Let's do master config copy. And let's do uh, let's do admin. Let me get some interesting things here. Let's do user. User interface credentials. Oh. Well, that explains what the original redaction was. We've got some stars here. We also see we've got a uh, so we've got our account, which is the admin. You know the name's admin. In this. We also have a type support user with the name supervisor, with some sort of redacted password. And if you'll notice, not only is it a redacted password in the sense that it's all stars, but uh, if it's the same as the other account, why is it shorter? Well, the answer is that uh, it's replacing letter for letter. So yeah. uh, this is the actual length of the uh, this is the actual length of the password here. So um, yeah, very, very interesting here. So we know that there's a supervisor user now, and we can actually confirm that if we go to our past login, because you remember we have user enumeration, so we know how to check if it's real, because if you put in test, it's gonna complain you failed four times. So let's try supervisor and see what happens. Oh, well, supervisor actually fails. Oh, my mistake, I guess it's only for admin. Well, either way, theoretically there's an account. Let's try and get at it, right? So, and we can also see there's some other values here. So there's some other password values that seem to be redacted. So now that we know that they redacted like that, let's look for anything with star. Well, we've got some things here that are star. We've got an encryption key that's star. We've got some other IP endpoints that are star. So these are probably all passwords from the guess of it. These are all encryption password, or not encryption, but connection passwords. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's do, whoop. Forgot I had that running. Let's do this. Let's uh, let's scan around the log files a little bit, right? So we've got some master configs here. We've got let's do boot calyx. We got some log files. Just kind of browse. We've got etc config. We've got startup config, which is a big file. Looks like it's got a bunch of different settings for it. Uh, you know, some redacted passwords again. Uh, you know, we've got exadata. We've got some different things here in exadata. We got panic. Panic has some targz files. We got dm log targz. Let's take a look at you know. Let's take a look at dm log targz. What's in it, right? Let's unpack the present. See what's inside. We get some different log files, and so think think about this. We know that it redacts the passwords for the users because it puts star in all the you know special fields. But obviously they're there at some point in time. Now. Um, you know, we know that uh, HTTP CGI had a case where, um, you know, it redacted that password. If we go back here, we know that it's redacting this. Well, let's uh, let's inspect this log file a little bit. Let's throw these out here. And we've got HTTP CGI. This is a this is a, a panic, by the way. So this is the panic folder. Um, let's just take a look and see what's inside of it. Scroll down to the bottom. Oh, well, what do you know about that? We've got some check authorization failures up here. And um, if you're the admin, you'll know that this is the admin password right here. So we have uh, within the uh, panic folder, they apparently are dumping a, a gzipped file called dmlog that has the unredacted version of the contents. And it doesn't get redacted because it's tar gz. You know, it doesn't match a basic string filter. So now we know that the admin password is uh, doubt guide china very. Well, that's that's cool. Um, let's try this. We know that we can trip a exception in the log by supplying this, and it appears to be redacting this, which I assume, based on the length being the same, that this is the password for the account. So next logical step, let's try to give a bad token for supervisor, right? If we give a bad token for supervisor by the same theory, should create a log entry like this with the password, let's try and get the supervisor password. So we'll go back to burp here. Uh, actually, we'll go back to CyberChef. We'll grab this. Go in here. We'll say uh, we'll try supervisor to see what it does, and we'll give uh, we'll give some invalid values here. We'll say xx. Grab this. Go over here. Throw it into uh, our authorization token. Submit it. We get a login. That's fine. Let's go back over to our device logs here, uh, and let's do this. Let's do 
Um, you can, uh, uh, by the way, I'm not entirely sure what causes the DM log file to generate, so I'm hoping that it works. Considering it says panic, I assume it's because I'm throwing a RAM. Oops, I'm making it die on RAM. You can do that with just spamming it with requests. Um, you can try and overload it with big requests, lots of requests. Just try to get it to panic because we know that panic apparently has that information. So if we don't get it reproduced here, um, we'll hit it a couple times until we get it to drop it. So uh, let's go here and we'll make another folder. And we know that we are looking for uh, panic. So let's grab our panic folder and throw it in. Inside our panic, let's see, 841. That looks to be modified recently. Let's see if we can get into this. We'll grab our HTTP CGI, pull this out. Let's see, do we have a dump? Oh, look at that, support check failed authorization, supervisor password support support one exclamation mark. So we now have credentials for the support user. Cool. So uh, next logical thought process is, what does the support user have access to? Right? Let's log out and let's see. We're gonna go out here, I'm gonna sign out. We're gonna say supervisor. We are going to log in with our very fancy support, support one exclamation mark, and let's see if it works. And just like that, we've logged in as the supervisor, and you'll notice we have access to the support features without needing to do any sort of tampering. So um, we definitely know now that the original tampering gave us access to support level features that were not intended for us. Um, now that we have the, the uh, supervisor user, which is the support type account, we do have access to those features again, but we're dead in the water, right? We have access to the support account. We know the password. It's basic. Where do we go from here? Um, well, in addition to everything else, by the way, I will say, um, rather than go through and, and show these credentials and stuff like that, the credentials are all there. Every single bit of sensitive information that was redacted is there. Passwords, WPA keys, everything's in that uh, DM log panic dump. Um, so that's great, but uh, we're still stuck. So let's take a look around at what we can do. Well, um, you know, we could try a couple things. We could go in and, uh, you know, we could do packet capture, right? Packet capture looks good. Let's try this. Let's do packet capture. Let's throw in some things. Uh, you know, we'll say 10 to 5. Uh, and let's just start the packet capture. And it looks like it's running. And here down here, we see that we have, we have some form of dictation over the values, right? So let's try this. Let's grab it and burp. If this is a normal, normal packet capture request, right? If this is creating some kind of command, which it looks to be right here, uh, which I will actually stop the ca uh, packet capture for so we can format it. There we go. Um, so we have some dictation over value. So first thing to try, can we do, you know, can we do something like this? Can we say, you know, ping gula.com or something like that, right? Can we get command execution? Well, we get status, good, good. And we saw in the, uh, let's see, which one is it? In this one uh, packet, we can actually get the capture status, which will show us the, uh, if you look, it'll show us the final command. Well, the final command, uh, right, final CMD, doesn't actually give us any access to ping google.com. It looks like it actually trims us off on the end. So that's a dead end, at least for the time being. So let's stop that. Um, and what you can do, um, you know, you can uh, download a packet capture after it's done. So we'll download that and take a look at the request there. Maybe we can get some kind of, uh, you know, file path privilege, right? Maybe we can do dot, dot, slash, uh, you know, etc shadow. Maybe we can dump the passwords. Well, it looks like we have no dictation over the value. It looks like it just gives us a file path. And uh, if I capture other binary content, yeah, we get temp pcap capture. So next things we try, well, maybe we try and, you know, maybe it's a very simple CGI server. Maybe, we, you know, it just checks the path like that. Maybe we can get out and grab ETC Shadow, download it. 400 bad request illegal file name. They've got filtering on it. So that's fine. That's fine. We'll go back to our packet capture endpoint here. Now you can play around with this for a while. I did. I certainly did. And what you'll find is if you dig through the logs, you'll actually find that some of the requests, some of the values are processed, but they're deemed invalid. Um, to show you some of those, I believe if I scroll up, I can probably grab some of them. Um, yeah, we've got we've got some injection here. These are on other endpoints, but it's the same thing. Um, it looks to be doing some kind of x exec command um, for the packet capture specifically. Let's see, these are log files. That's not going to be any help. Um, looks to be doing some kind of x exec x get 
Um, so at this point in time, this is where I kind of called it, right? Actually, no, this isn't where I called it. I actually did try one more thing. In the log file, if we looked around a little bit further, we would find that there is something called sysinfo log. Sysinfo log is a wonderful log. It contains information about the entire file system. It contains information about all running processes, including command arguments that are being specified. If you were uh, looking at this, you would find in detail that there is actually a uh, Taiwanese slash Chinese antivirus that is constantly running and analyzing all HTTP uh, P traffic across your network and all other sort of TCP traffic that comes pre-installed that you can't disable. Um, on top of that, it dumps some PS info. We see some logs here. You might look, by the way, you might say, oh, maybe we can, you know, manipulate this to run some commands, right? Maybe we can change time.nist.gov to, you know, and and run something else. Well, that's not the case. Can't have any dictation over the uh, over the NTP servers, at least not that I found yet. So that's a dead end. We can see we can see some stack commands here. We see oh, uh, you know, here's more process information. Uh, but eventually, you'll see oh, well, here's some open connections. This is great here, um, and we can see oh, well, we can see our IP tables. Right, we can see all the IP table rules, uh, and if I scroll down a little further, we can also see uh, we can see a dump of the file system. You'll see this is DF. We can see how everything's getting mounted. Um, you can see all the different data on the system. But for sake of ease, we'll notice the drop bear is actually running. If you're looking through these processes, you'll see there's a drop bear service. Now, who's familiar with drop bear? Anybody? Christian especially is because I'm pretty sure that's what ESXi uses, if I'm not mistaken. Am I am I yeah. mistaken? No, you're you're not mistaken. But I mean, honestly, drop bear SSH is used by tons and tons of things. Particularly it, a lot of stacks that happen to use PHP as well. Mm -hmm. Drop bear is pretty common in embedded devices, I will say. Um, gener generally, I'll see it in embedded devices. Um, other cases, I'll see something like uh, Open SSHD or something like that. You know, um, but in this case, drop bear is an SSH system. Uh, we can see that it's listing on port 3007. So next logical step, can we connect to SSH? Well, if I look for 3007, you'll learn the unfortunate truth, which is that all LAN requests to the SSH port shall be dropped. It may listen on all different sorts of IPs for 3000 or 30,007, but it drops it from LAN. Well, we can actually bypass this. It doesn't get us very far at the moment, but we can actually bypass this. If we were to go in, uh, and we tried to do something like, uh, let's see, port forwarding. What we can actually do is we can set the IP address to the local system, uh, because if you actually look at the, uh, this takes a little bit of IP tables from angling. Um, if you actually look at the uh, IP table rules, you'll notice that this is only for anything coming from the uh, LAN port. Um, so what we can actually do here, oops, come on, so um, what we can actually do here, brlan is the uh, the output, right? So uh, anything that comes in through the LAN port rejects, right? No 3007. But what we can do is if we enable port forwarding and we redirect it to the router's IP address and we say, oh yeah, we want to connect on 30,007. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, oh yeah, 30,010 from the LAN. That'll, that'll, that'll work just fine. Um, what you will find is that our public IP address with 30,010 uh, 30, will actually get you a connection to the SSH server. I would show you, but I'd have to leave the meeting and reconnect. Source, trust me, it lets you get access to the SSH, but you still need to know the, the username and the password. Um, if you were looking at the logs, because we're getting short on time, I'll try and hurry up a little bit. Um, if you looked at the logs, what you would find is that there is actually a configuration in the, uh, let's see, I believe it's LMD info. LMD info is the device manager. It contains configuration information for the entire device. Um, if we search for drop bear, we will see there's a drop bear section for configuration where it actually says root password authorization is one, which means it's allowed and root login is also allowed. So we know the username's root. We don't know the password. We're getting there. So uh, that's one really cool tool. We've made it a little bit far. Um, you know, we can get we can get access to SSH. We don't know the password. We know that access to all the other accounts. You can try the account passwords for SSH. Does not work. We know that roots the login for it. Apparently, it's set by factory as well because there's no config file that dumps the password. So it's probably a factory set root password. So it's probably the same on all these devices. So that's awesome. Um, let's see what else can we do here. Uh, yes. So um, this is where I gave up, or I didn't give up, but I took a break because. 
I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried to do command injection, could not get it to work for the life of me. Um, and I kept having to download device logs to see what the device was saying every single time. Now, this is where I would go into point four, right? Know your limits. I tried, I went through it. I, you know, I spent a night on it, couldn't get anywhere with it. So I finally, I asked Shane and I said, hey, do you have any ideas for what's going on with this? I said, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on this. I think you might find it interesting, but I'm stuck on it. Shane got back to me. He said, hey, yeah, well, I found this documentation here. And he actually linked me this, and this is where we're kind of at right now. He linked me this, this Calyx Prem API test. Now, if you're looking through the logs here, um, you see this API test has some interesting things called test XDEL, which appears to do some sort of XDEL commands or test XGET, which appear to do some kind of GET commands. Uh, if you look through Secret Searcher though, uh, on this uh, real quick here, you will actually find that XGET is a common command that is used on the system. In fact, if we go back to our CGI log file and we search x git, we can see that some of these commands for like downloading logs and stuff like that are running through xgit. So we have an idea of what system it's using in the background here. Um, and so with that information, I thought, oh, xgit, that's really neat. He said, can you try to connect to a debug port or a, a console or something? Well, we know from sysinfo that uh, most of the interesting connections are all listening on the loopback address. So we don't really have access to it. The only thing we have access to is some clients for configuration of DNS and IP, but most of the interesting stuff's running on localhost and we can't access it. I tried port forwarding, port forward won't let you do it. Can't port forward anything to 127.0.0.1. But, right, the thing that we thought originally could maybe be an attack vector for command injection. What about if we leverage that a little outside the box? What about, if we tried to use packet capture, and instead of saying for the auth zero interface, what if we captured the loopback interface? Let's try it. So we'll grab a command. Let's see, this is our TCP dump here. We grab this final command here. We'll say host IP. Let's try this. We're gonna capture local adapter. And we know that the adapter is LO. This is all information you can get uh, from, I believe, eh, Oh gosh, I don't know. F1 okay. might show it. Yeah, here we go. Hello is the default there, right? Exactly. Yeah, LO is the default. We can see from the adapters logs, LO is the local loopback adapter. We can see there's a lot of information going across it, by the way. We see there's a lot going on. So, uh, and we can see all the other interfaces, but let's try LO. So we know the interface is LO. We'll say TCP and uh, we'll say file size. We'll say 10, that should be good. So let's try and submit and see what happens. We get status one. Looks like it's working. Go back to the page here. Refresh. We check it out. We actually see the command that it's running is for the interface for loopback and it's capturing for the host 127001. So that's interesting. So let's try this. Let's stop the packet capture for now. Uh, and I'll start it again here for a second so we have a nice clean slate. By the way, it wants you to limit it to 10. You can bypass it entirely on this. So you theoretically could DOS the system. Um, if you wanted to give it more than that, we'll give it 20. We'll go back here. We'll say, um, let's see, what was I going to do? Oh, yeah, tools. So there's a nice little tool here called configurate. Uh, no, it's not configuration. It is diagnostics. Diagnostics lets you look at log files and you can download the log file. Now, when you do the download log file, it downloads a dump like this. Um, let me grab the, let's see, where was that? That was under, I believe, diet, yeah, okay, here we go. Okay, we go back to proxy here, here we go. Uh, log dump, so we'll see log dump, we'll give a list of available log names. You can try to inject into these parameters, by the way, steer log never loads, never works. Um, so what we'll do, uh, and then log download does not actually do anything there either. So what we'll do is we'll throw these over to our repeater window here. And we'll say, you know, hmm, let's try this. Let's do, I don't think I actually did that. I think I did log download for that. Log dump, that doesn't do anything. Log download, there we go, cool, okay. So let's try this. Uh, we are going to start a packet capture um, for the loopback adapter. We are going to go back here and we are going to try to dump content for uh, steer log txt. And we are going to try to download the content. And then simply we're going to go back and we are going to stop our packet capture and then we're going to download it. 
And what you'll notice is we actually get a tar file back. It actually has content in it, and it actually includes the unencrypted traffic of all of the command consoles uh, interacting with each other, all of the CLI elements. So opening this up, immediately we can see we have xgit going on here. Let's open this up in a TCP stream. Config git WAN port. OK, so we have access to some of the stuff that it's doing internal. Great. We can also see, I don't know if it captured it, there's some uh, alerts and API endpoints, but let's do steer log and see where that is. OK, well, here's one. Let's follow the TCP string. And it'll take a little second to finish that up here. It's got to parse through all the packets. We're getting close on time. Ooh. Uh, let's see. Hey, man, no, re no reason to rush it, right? Feel free to take <laughs> another five minutes or so if you need to, you know, after sure. after 10 o'clock. Or, or we can continue this on, this journey, this adventure on next Wednesday session. So don't feel like you need to rush it. Although sure. I will say, I am a little bit jealous of how fast you're able to type and click around. Right, Travis? <laughs> Dude, is, I, my uh, eyes don't work as fast as his mouse moves. I can't, <laughs> I can't follow it. It's like a sobriety <laughs> test over like here. <laughs> Right, and, it's and he clicks instantly. The good news is, the good news is, it's recorded, so you can put it back at half speed, and then. <laughs> so, yes, they do. This but, is uh, so continue. Yeah, sure. So uh, if we go through and we look, we see actually, you can see the red is going to be our uh, packets going from, and the blue is coming to. We can see actually that we are executing steer log. And we see could not parse XML document. Cool. So we do have uh, some form of commands that are going back and forth between the server. Um, and we can see exactly what we're doing now, because we, you'll remember we issued the steer log command. And even we did log download, and it gave us this back. So you know, now that we can kind of see what's going on back and forth with the files, let's try some injection. Actually, real quick here, we'll analyze this just a teensy bit more. Um, if we switch this to hex dump mode here, you'll notice just to understand the protocol that at the end of it, it specifies the end of a command with a zero A. Now that's a new line. I believe that's a carriage return, if I'm not mistaken. Um, a carriage return, basically a new line. Um, so we know that if we want to run a command, we put a zero A at the end, that specifies the end of a line. So now we know the format a little bit. Let's go back here to our uh, packet capture interface. And what we'll do uh, is we will grab, uh, we'll do a packet capture start here. We'll go back, act, actually, yeah, we'll leave that on. We'll go back here to our steer log command. And we have an idea of the format that it's going to use back and forth. We can already see um, that this is the command that it's running in raw. So let's do this. Let's try to escape steer log. So what we'll do is we'll go to burp and we'll say, okay, we're going to do a single quote and we're going to escape that. And we're going to give you 000A. This is going to inject a new line character into our JavaScript or into our uh, JSON object. So now we'll try uh, we'll try uh, X exec because if you looked at the uh, if you looked at that little GitHub API test uh, that I had pulled up here, um, in the actual page here, they seem to mention a command called xexec that seems to have some sort of privilege. So let's try xexec. So we'll do xexec start bin bash. Let's just try that and see what happens. And we'll do u000a, and we will try to run this command. And then we'll paste it in here to just double check and make sure. And we get nothing in response. So theoretically, maybe we failed, right? Well, let's go back and double check and see what happens with this. Let's reload our page here. We'll stop that. We'll download our packet capture and we'll grab our download file and we will close all these Wireshark windows as well. So let's open this up, unzip the packet capture file, bring it up. Frame contains steer log. We got a couple commands here. Let's follow the stream. And it looks like we got steer log with a new line and exec start bash with another new line. Now what's interesting is we'll see unsupported verb and then we get this weird error, dcli command not found. But um, you know what's really interesting? Um, we don't see anything about our x exec. So that's neat. Uh, to be entirely honest with you, last time I ran an invalid x exec command, 
this may have actually uh, started bin bash. Um, so I may have accidentally screwed myself over by getting a, a bash shell to open in this case. But we do know, we do know at the end of the line here, we do know that this is a new line and we do see that it's complaining this command is not found. So we know that we do have command injection because we have unsupported verb, which is this X exec. And then we do have this uh, CLI not found, which is this. We do actually have some command injection. If I do an invalid um, command, um, you would see uh, that X exec is not a valid command is what it complains about. But I think I actually accidentally just a cheap code execution. Last time I didn't try and start bin bash, but um, whoops. Anyways, we have command execution on the system. Now, here's the problem. We have command execution. We don't have SSH, but considering that it doesn't seem to be Complaining about bin bash, I think we can probably just spawn a reverse shell at this point. Uh, and uh, if you were to take a look as well at our var log file and you open it up, um, I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe the user group is root entirely. So theoretically, if we can spawn a command as this, we've got reverse shell as root. And uh, I think that's all I've got for the presentation. <laughs> so. Wow. So. Uh, I have to say, absolutely fantastic job. This is our first, I think, live demo of like any type of penetration testing, reverse engineering, that kind of stuff. Uh, so you did an absolutely awesome job. Um, obviously, you took the opportunity in advance to like uh, reverse engineer, think through these things. If I may ask, just out of curiosity, so for you getting up to this point, how many hours would you approximate that you put into this? Um, I would say probably this is probably eight to nine hours of invested time going through it. Yeah, because I it, it looks easy to do in an hour, but you've got to, you know, you test it. Areas. No, no, it does not oh, yeah. look easy. It doesn't look easy at all. <laughs> you did a fantastic job of taking your nine hours of effort, right, and boiling it into one hour and taking us through your stream of consciousness of how you discovered each component, right? And in reverse engineering it. So no, absolutely awesome. Uh, certainly, I think this is uh, something that uh, we should return back to. I don't know if it'll be next week or the week after. So definitely, I don't want to be like imposing where like, oh, hey, next week, you got to have it rooted for us. Well, you know? th there is some talk about getting root access. And there also is some talk uh, that I excluded for brevity's sake um, about actually physically attacking the board. That is removing components and testing them and dumping the firmware that way. Yeah, and you asked me about that. And we'll get we'll get time on the calendar for that. Uh, basically, uh, so, you know, honestly, it's this close being done virtually. I, you, mm -hmm. you one could pull it from the EEPROM, right? Or one could pull it from the pull the firmware, right? But I feel like in a certain way, like that would be great for like a Google Home type of device or something like that, where you're trying to reverse engineer it, that type of thing, where it has that level of security, and that's made by a multi-billion dollar enterprise, right? This mm -hmm. has obviously been slapped together by what is it? The company's Calyx, I believe. Calyx is the Calyx. Yeah. Calyx with their Gigas, uh, uh, Gigaspire uh, router uh, devices, right? Um, so um, certainly, I you, you are right on the precipice there. So I want to take the opportunity of pondering on this as well. As hopefully trying to give you a couple other tidbits to kind of explore down. Um, as, a, as a side note, I will say for those who are observant, you'll also notice that it did dump the credentials in the first packet um, of the packet capture as well. <laughs> we can see it there as well. So there's actually two password reveals. It uh, reveals it in the device logs under the panic, but also if you're able to capture the uh, local loopback connections, you can also dump uh, here and uh, here as well. <laughs> of using the, the loopback adapter for the capture and, and performing reconnaissance, honestly, Never seen anyone else do that. So that was a really good technique there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To that team, does anyone have any good questions for Dennis? Anything like that? Comments for him? Uh, I think that was pretty awesome. Hey, I'm Nick. We haven't really met before, but uh, uh, why why was why was it sending all the traffic across the loopback interface again? Like like why, why like what was the purpose of it doing so that? 
so I believe what it was. So, okay. So normally applications would be configured in a situation like this, where they would use like a local file for like a socket or something like that. Um, in this case though, they configured it in such a way that instead of sending it to a file or anything like that, it actually just connects to the service that's only available on the loopback adapter. So um, rather than having to manage all these different kind of queues, they just basically made a TCP socket that accepted commands back and forth. Um, I would assume that's probably why they configured it, just for for ease yeah. sake. Um, that would yeah, be my yeah, best guess. Because, yeah, because that's interesting. I, when you started going down that route, I was thinking to myself, like, like what device or like operating system would, would specifically, you know, send that, that that traffic across its loopback, you know, just kind of arbitrarily. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, it's the the way that I actually came across it. Yeah, the way I came across it was when I was looking at these loopbacks. I was like, man, there's a lot of services here, but you'll see that all of the all of, they're all listening, so they're all they're all hosting, but they're only listening on the loopback. And then I thought, well, it's loopback adapter, and it's not listed by the way. You can't in the packet capture options. There's no loopback adapter, but if you manually specify it, I'd assume it probably filters it before it gives it back to the. Um, to the web front end. Um, if you manually specify it, you can capture these. And considering you're a local connection, I mean, it, it goes back to point number one, understand what their threat model is. They're not threat modeling for the internal users, right? And they're also especially not threat modeling for somebody who has access to listen to 12011 or uh, 12001. Um, they anticipate that anything that's on the loopback is never going to be seen. It's only going to be seen by the system. So you'll notice there's no encryption. Um, there's absolutely no kind of protection on the local loopback adapter. So um, awesome. I think uh, previously in our conversations, you were noting that you believe that this is based on DDD, uh, DDWRT. Is that correct? Uh, open WRT. I'm not for sure. I think that may have been in map giving me a weird reading. Um, I did run in map against it to kind of see what the ports were at initial analysis, but it's pretty conventional to, to, to see something like that. Actually, believe it or not. So like, um, Many of you guys have probably heard of Cisco Meraki. It's now deployed across a lot of enterprises. But before Cisco acquired them, they actually used OpenWRT uh, for their, their firmware. And the older access, Cisco Meraki access points, you can actually reflash the firm, firmware on them, right? And run your own version of OpenWRT if you don't want to pay Cisco's crazy ass licensing fees, right? Um, so that being noted, so. Likely that's the case. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I just pulling up the I pulled up the spec sheet earlier when I was taking a gander at this. And then um, one of the things that I wanted to note was so the uh, supervisor. And so I think there's a supervisor and a support account, right? Su um, supervisor is the type support account. There's an admin okay. type and then there's a support type. Yeah, I see. OK, so were you able to validate if that's something that is specific to internet service providers or if that's specific to the device in general? Well, I believe it's specific to the ISP. And the reason why I say that is because the configuration XML that is provided by the ISP contains the password setting for that. Now, I don't uh -huh. think the root password is set by the ISP because it's not in the config file. Yeah. Um, so that would be my guess. OK, very good. OK, cool. Thank you for that insight. That's really helpful. Does anyone have any other good questions or comments for Dennis? Um, I don't have any questions because that was, uh, I'd say, a little advanced beyond my scope. But I would say that is a great example of not only efficiency of using Burp Suite and looking through log files. Um, so for me, that was kind of eye opening. I, th I thought it was very interesting, even though I didn't comprehend a lot of it. Um, not at the fault of you, it's a fault of my own experience. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed that, and I was kind of smiling the whole way. Awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> so then to that, guys. So again, Dennis, awesome job. Thank you so much. Let's do this. Let's uh, make sure we send Dennis off with some of our gratitude here in the feedback survey. So I just posted it into the chat here for everybody. Uh, when you guys have a brief moment, either tonight or early tomorrow, please just uh, add some items to the feedback survey, uh, letting us know uh, in regards to like the structuring of it, that kind of stuff. Obviously, this was purposely a little bit less structured, right? And I think that Dennis, you did a great job of having it where it was structured enough where you actually went through every every troubleshooting and reverse engineering step. Right. And as you were going through it over many, many hours, and then you consolidated that into one hour. So that was really awesome. 
Uh, also, be sure to guys to let us know what other content and things you want to learn about and upcoming training sessions. Uh, if any of you guys want to do your own type of presentations or you guys want to talk about particular topics, don't hesitate to let us know. Um, we're always open to that. And then uh, we're going to continue to encourage folks. So uh, at, at this juncture, you guys can continue to add and forward this on to other folks, right? I not right now, Travis and myself have not posted on LinkedIn because it's one of those spaces where sometimes there's a lot of salespeople and there's also just a lot of like weirdos who just like throw tons of spammy shit at people, right? So that's why we have avoided putting it out there in that way. But if there are other people you guys know that are interested in cybersecurity, regardless of what their skill level is, if they like talking about it and, and they're interested in it, like Dennis has been joining all the time, even though obviously he is a fairly advanced person comparatively, right? Add more people, forward it around. That's not a problem at all. You can send them the Notion link, the Notion link to our InfoSec uh, mentoring just again for a reference for everyone is here. So feel free to spread it around. Don't hesitate to let us know if you guys got any questions or concerns in regards to how we can improve the process and we'll continue to do that. So again, Dennis, thank you so much for all your hard work on this. Looking forward to following. I'm gonna ponder on this a little bit on my free time and see if I can give you any more tips or tricks myself. Although I think I might be out of my element, honestly. Well, I appreciate that, Christian. I appreciate all the uh, positive feedback for it. Not a problem. Any last times before we jump off here, team? No? OK. Well, everyone, have a fantastic Thursday night and an upcoming weekend. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you, guys. guys. Thank you. Thanks.